Hi, I'm David Peterson, the creator of MouseGuard, and welcome to Creator Commentary for the second series of MouseGuard, Winter 1152. This episode will cover issue 6, or chapter 6, when it was collected into a hardcover edition. For this issue, I'll be doing the commentary as audio only, but please feel free to follow along in your copy of the story in either issue form or from the hardcover, as I talk about the behind-the-scenes details, art notes, and my headspace, as I go page by page and panel by panel. Also, a fair warning, there will be spoilers if you have not yet read this or the rest of the Mouse Guard series. Cover. The Hairs! Before I'd started working on Winter, when Jeff Darrow was preparing to do his pinup for the series, he emailed and asked, Are your mice always on foot, or do they ever ride other animals as mounts? I replied that I hadn't yet, but I had the ideas for them riding hares or ducks in the future. Now, when I said the future, I didn't mean issue six of Winter. I meant a vague sometime down the line I may eventually. But as I was plotting issues of the series, I think it was when I was drawing issue three. I decided that including hairs would be a great addition to the story to help explain and elevate some of the snow travel. So for my version, I looked to Jeff's saddle design as inspiration first. Then I made some of my own artistic decisions, like the log flume style seats and adding some quilting to the pads for some texture. The figures are looking to the left, which psychologically means returning to our visual storytelling minds. Characters going to the right are going away, and to the left are returning. Even though in story terms, these characters are once again traveling away from Lockhaven, as a cover, it suggests the ultimate return home that the mice are on. Inside front cover. I don't have much to add about the recap text, but the poem was written to deal with the idea of animal species and their relationships in Mouseguard. Since I was going to feature the hares in this issue, I wanted to suggest that while mice and hares are not predators of one another, they still don't co-mingle, and that the writer of this poem, Roybin the Scribe, is asking if that really should be the case, or should the grain eaters find more common ground. This spot illustration was drawn specifically for this issue. It shows a single pair of mouse tracks with acorn cap snowshoes in the snow, while something else digs a trail as it drags. This is supposed to be Liam's tracks from the middle of the issue where he's carrying Kelena and the axe, but more on that when we get to those pages. Page 1. Panel 1. Angry Face Liam. I referenced his angry face from the first issue of Fall when he was screwing up his courage when confronting the snake. I had to try and adapt it towards the way I was drawing the mice in winter, though. The ghostly narration boxes throughout this page are a collection of Kelena's advice to Liam throughout winter. He is hearing them in his mind, not unlike Luke hearing Obi-Wan saying, Use the false. Though less an active voice since the words are things Kalanaw had already said. Panel 2. To do the pencil layout for this panel, I just pasted in an enlarged version of Kalanaw from the back cover of issue 5 into my Photoshop page template. I of course redrew it in ink so that the line quality matched the scale of the rest of the art on this page. The first-time reader here still doesn't know if Kelena is dead. It's something I don't answer for several more pages. Panel 3. The ghost narration builds up to this new mantra of Liam's about the greater good Kelena kept talking about. But I worried that this new slogan could be as easily perverted as it matters not what you fight, but what you fight for to become the ends justify the means. It wasn't until the epilogue of the Black Axe book that I could try to address that issue in the pages of Mouse Guard. The layout for this panel is once again an almost recreation of the Winter No. 5 cover, just from a different angle, and without the owl melting into the snow. Page 2, Panel 1. The Approach. In some ways, I could have skipped this panel and gone right to Panel 2, but I liked drawing out Liam's steps a bit more with this. I think it may have felt like the reader missed something if I'd skipped this panel and you went from the last panel of page one straight to the second panel on this page. Panel two, the first stab, which is an impact much like how Liam killed the snake in fall. Panel three, the second attack, a thrust to the leg. Note it's the other leg that Kalanaw didn't injure in issue five, making the owl now injured from head to toe. A careful look will show that Liam is still in tears as he battles. Panel 4. 
Back in panel two, I used a color hold on the owl's good eye, making the pupil a faded color. In this panel, we are able to see both eyes. The bloody one and the other one are now both diminished. A visual I tend to use to show death, like the snake in fall and the bat earlier in winter. Little art detail notes. The line implying the owl's fall was inked in black and then reversed in Photoshop to become a white effect, while the shape of the sword sticking out from the owl's leg was whited out in the original inks to be filled in gray when this page was colored. Page 3, panel 1. The aerial shot was to give me a way to set the landscape again, showing where Liam and Kelena were in relationship to the owl and where it fell. Liam's snowshoe tracks helped tell some of the story of this panel. Panel 2. I chose not to show Kelena's face, which is obstructed by his hood here, to prolong the suspense about his survival. Liam grabs the axe, but with gloves on. This is something Kelena mentioned earlier about Midnight being the only mouse to have wielded the weapon and not been the Black Axe, who didn't end up getting killed by it. Later in Black Axe, I explained that historically, only the wielder of the axe is allowed to touch it with bare paws. And as the honor hasn't been bestowed on Liam yet, I was trying to be sure he never broke those rules. Panel 3. Liam, while wielding the axe, becomes a silhouette. He is anonymous. He is more than himself. He is Kelenaw. He is Liam. He is the Black Axe. Panel 4. And the moment of the killing blow is edited around. We see the before in panel 3, and then I shift to a framing where we can't see the axe split the owl's head. Only the effects from it. Another visual note of the owl's demise is that asterisk of death I stole from Eastman and Laird from Shredder's death in TMNT. And now, the good eye is forever faded. Page 4, panels 1 through 3. A series of panels meant to be read as very little time passing between each gutter. For these animation-like panels, I used the same pencils for the owl and axe over and over, but redrew Liam falling. And then, I inked each panel, never reusing the inks from the previous panel, so that it all looked hand-drawn and not like a Photoshop trick. The effort and emotional cost of this battle has caused Liam to collapse. Panel 4. And with Liam passed out, the reader still has no idea about the outcome of the two mice, if either are still alive. Page 5. Panel 1. The hairs again! We also reunite with Isabel the guard mouse, based on my sister-in-law Ashley from issue 3. I built part of this stable room as a model. I think I just made two sets of trusses and columns, all out of cardboard and printed paper. I locked down my camera tripod and then moved the model section along an incrementally marked line, taking a photo of it in, at each position so I could assemble the entire room's perspective in Photoshop. The model didn't survive, unfortunately, but I still have the Photoshop files for what each truss and column looks like flat. If I ever had to make it again, I'd rebuild it in wood craft sticks for survivability. The stable room, as well as the saddles and hair tack, suggests that there have been perhaps alliances between mice and hares in the past. Panel 2. For the hares' speech bubbles, I used a slightly different color, and I used a different font to be clear they have what would be an accent to mouse ears. The further a mouse gets from its own species, the less and less it can understand of language. So a hare has an accent, but a snake or bird just makes noises. I also worked at trying some different speech patterns to offset the idea of their accents. Panel 3. Saxon's line as he thumbs the edge of his sword blade still cracks me up. And Kenzie, ever the diplomat, puts the request more delicately and more directed at the hares themselves. The angle of this panel is looking down on the mice slightly, as if from a hare's point of view. Page 6, panel 1. Kenzie call him Liam their tenderfoot, needs to be edited in future printings to be Tenderpaw, as the rank is referred to in the role-playing game. This panel is about scale, pulling back far enough to include a hare at height next to a mouse, and even showing that a hare doesn't quite fit without ducking its ears under trusses in a larger mouse room. Panel 2. Even though Kenzie starts by talking to the hares, he ultimately asks Isabel's permission, but she leaves the decision up to the lead hare, she sees the hares as less of others because of her time with them. 
and lets them make the call like free beasts instead of treating them just like mounts. Gelham, Hylan, and Yedel are some origin spellings and pronunciations for the surnames of Gilliam, Palin, and Idol, three members of the comedy troupe Monty Python. I looked up origins of the other members' names, but none of them worked as well for naming the hares. Panel 3. As the hares depart Lockhaven, somewhere at ground level, I still haven't produced a floor plan of the home of the guard, I visually cut away the roof for this panel. I think I'd do this differently today. I'd instead place the reader's point of view outside in the snow, with the hares coming right at us, with one perhaps passing us, while we can still catch a view of one just starting their stride inside the stable, rather than doing this odd cutaway. Page 7. This page is a 180 degree rotation of the previous page's layout. Panels 1 through 3. These panels were an exercise in finding lots of hair running reference from different angles, and having enough of each that I could get three of each direction or angle. Collectively, these panels imply a long journey, mostly moving left to right across the panel. Page 8, Panel 1. With the hairs all having Python-inspired names, there is some inherent humor in their dialogue. Them calling owls feathered nocturnes and mice squeakers. Saxon gets in on it, too, by calling them long ears. The middle hair Yadel's line, ceased to be it has, is meant to be a reference to the Monty Python dead parrot sketch. Panel 2. Other than scale, I'm not sure how Isabel knows that the wound is specifically mouse-made, but still, the other two mice should probably suspect that this is the owl from issue 1 with that red eye. Panel 3. I've had a few readers think this panel and the last panel on the next page are actually connected, but Liam's footprints being visible and not matching up in both break the illusion. Page 9. This page is a mirror of the previous page's layout. Isabel reminds Gillum about the price of the bargain. The hares aren't doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. I have her refer to the hares' home as their burrow. I'm surprised I didn't say Warren here. I think I may have been worried that readers would think I was referring to another hare named Warren. And as they run on to follow the tracks, we have the moment captured on the cover, but in a reverse direction. Panel 3. As we've not yet seen Liam with the owl feather as a flag, the shape just over the snow's horizon is meant to be confusing. I also did a color hold on it to try and get it caught in the glow of the light of the sky. Page 10, panel 1. Liam is alive, though. Enough to Samwise Gamgee the supplies, Kellinaw, and the Black Axe through the snow. The feather was meant to stand tall like a dune buggy's flag, so that it could perhaps be seen even if Liam was down low in a snow valley. Panels 2 through 3. But then, as Liam collapses, I'm still trying to keep the reader in a state of anticipation over Liam and Kellinaw's fates. Did Liam just die? Kellinaw even survive at all? Panel 4. I had Isabel stay back with the hares, partly so that this moment felt more personal with Saxon and Kenzie's looks to one another. A lot seems to pass between them, even though the reader doesn't quite know what yet. But also I had Isabel not present because of the black axe being exposed, and that needing to stay a secret. Page 11, panel 1. Scene change. We're back at Lockhaven, and Quigley, the lookout from Fall Issue 5, is still at his post at Lockhaven, as he announces figures that approach the gates. Panel 2. And in this case, those arriving are another patrol of guard mice mentioned earlier. Sienna's party of Bastion, based on Jeremy Bastion, Delvin, based on Nate Pride, and Aubrey, who appeared in one panel of Fall Number 5. While already at Lockhaven, checking in are Elemis, based on Mark Smiley, and that name is an anagram of Smiley, and his patrol of Cerise, based on my sister Kirsten, Sela, based on my sister Lisa, and Annika. Aubrey is pushing in a sled of supplies, something I didn't think about the mice needing logistically until after I'd already drawn our main cast without one in issue one. I based the sled on the Klondike Derby sled our Boy Scout troop made when I was in the Scouts. Panel 3. For the reference architecture for this panel, I found a photo of the Benedictine Monastery of San Pierre de Rhodes in Spain that reminded me of the visuals I'd already drawn of this part of Lock Haven from fall, when midnight was storming the fortress. 
I added in the wooden balcony, which, in my mind, connected in some way to the wooden stairs Rand leads Sadie up to warn Gwendolyn in Fall Issue 5. Someday I'm going to have to make a cutaway diagram of what Lockhaven really looks like on the inside. The dialogue in this panel is just world-building references and some patrol hardships to add flavor. Panel 4. Besides needing one more panel as a beat before the events of the page turn, I thought it would be nice to have a slightly closer view of the mice and the returning patrols. Though, for some reason, they look like they are in some sort of standoff, which wasn't my intent. Page 12, panel 1. As I said in a previous commentary, I figured Lockhaven was covered in snow, with the area around the entrance being hollowed out, but not exposed. This run-up by the mice and hares suggests that a tunnel has been made that leads to the gates. Not sure how that works, but, you know, suspend some disbelief, talking mice and all. Panel 2. Liam is alive! Well, eagle-eyed viewers would notice that he's awake in panel 1 of this page as he rides with Saxon and Highland. To do the pencils for this panel, I used lots of overlaid sheets of copy paper on a light box. I separately drew the background, the hairs, and the clusters of mice all on different sheets. It was easier to compose the image and make adjustments to each element without ever having to worry about erasing some other part of the image as I was making corrections. Because I had fans at conventions asking me how, or just mispronouncing Kellanaw's name, I added in the dialogue here between Bastion and Delvin to help make it clear that it's not Selanawi, but Kel and Awe. Panel 3. Liam is injured here almost as an afterthought as I was drawing this page. He and Sienna both seem to be looking at his arm in panel 2, and I needed a moment before the next page's events and thought, Liam shouldn't get out of this all unscathed. I didn't want him scarred, so a broken bone seemed like the right fit. Page 13. This is a 180-degree rotation of the previous page's layout. Panel 1. As Gwendolyn is asking from above about Kellanaw and Liam, Kenzie and Saxon hide the axe. The idea is to still keep the legend of the axe by keeping the truth of Kellanaw being its wielder a secret to the masses. Originally in the outline, it was Liam who was going to hide it. Not sure why I changed it, other than that having Saxon do it works better for a moment in the epilogue, and I guess it would have been odd to have Liam doing that right after I broke his arm in the last page. Panel 2. Over in the hallway on the left, you can see Saxon is wandering off with the wrapped axe, as the other mice learn, panel 3, of Kellanaw's fate. I'm still happy with Gwendolyn's body language in this panel, as well as my choice to drop out most of the background to help convey the mood of loss. Page 14. Panel 1. To frame the funeral scene and design the balcony, I cut up one of those rigid paper plates, the kind with a very solid molded edge ridge, and fashioned it into the balcony shape you see here. To populate the model with mice and keep track of where they all were, I raided my Risk board game and pulled out the single infantry pieces. I used color pieces for main characters and gray pieces for the masses. Panel 2. For the drape over Kellanaw's shroud, I used Photoshop to warp a Celtic knot pattern over the form of his body. I then printed out that warped version on a light box, and I could ink it by hand on the page. The mice carrying him are nameless guard mice. Panel 3. The apiary keeper from Fall arrives with his censer, smoking away. Obviously, this is some part of the funeral ritual, but I couldn't tell you what. The last issue of Fall wrapped up very quickly, too quickly, and I felt that I had to use the epilogue to truly ease out of that narrative. So I wanted to give this moment of Kellanaw's funeral plenty of room for the end of the winter book, and I took my time by giving it six pages of space. Page 15. This page's layout is the same as the previous pages. Panel 1. The bed of wood is lit by four other guard mice. I think I liked the symbolism of four carrying him and four lighting him, of those mice to be representing north, east, south, and west. Kalanaw's older sister Rosalie is shown going through this funeral pyre ritual in a flashback to Kalanaw's childhood in the Black Axe book. Panels 2 and 3. I'm just trying to slow down the pacing here giving these two full beats after the pyre is lit in panel one, before we get to the funeral ceremony on the next page. 
Since it is a ceremony, I figured the methodical beats felt right. Page 16, panels 1 through 3. Using the risk piece paper plate map for everyone's placement, I could pan around the funeral attendees and never draw anyone out of place. Familiar mice on this page are Gwendolyn, Sela, Elemis, Landra, Liam, Annika, Quigley, Sienna, Sadie, Kenzie, and Cerise. Everyone else is a generic nameless mouse, though a few are the torchbearers and the ones who carried in Kelenaw. Liam is on the mend with his arm in a sling. Gwendolyn's speech is a variation on ashes to ashes, dust to dust, with a little biblical so-and-so who begat so-and-so thrown in. Sadie's dialogue in panel three is actually in my typed outline for the issue, a place I almost never bother to write out full dialogue. But then, handwritten in pencil next to it, I have Kenzie saying something different. Quote, For the good of all mice, it's better not to know our heroes die. End quote. While a good line, I think the published version does a better job at explaining that while mice here all knew of a mouse named Kalanaw who arrived at the end of the previous fall, only a handful knew and understood him to be the legendary Black Axe. Page 17, panels 1 through 3. More familiar mouse faces on this page. Roybin, Delvin, Bastion, Isabel, Rand, and Saxon. Sayan is the name of the afterlife for the brave mice. It is a Valhalla, or Elysian Fields version of Mouse Heaven. I've mentioned it in other Mouse Guard short stories before, most noticeably Service to Sayan, which was published as a free comic book day story and later collected in Baldwin the Brave and other tales. I had a mental trail of how I came up with the word Saiyan as the name for it, but I have since forgotten the word path. I thought it had to do with a Native American word for afterlife or peace, but I can't find any translations that would be a logical jump to the word Saiyan. Rand, who is on a crutch, suggests a belief in mythology that the Black Axe is immortal, an explanation for the legend being much older than the lifespan of one mouse, even one as old as Kalanaw and something I play with a bit more in the Black Axe series. Saxon, having been through his experience coming face to face with his mentor's bones, hauntingly says that no mouse is immortal. Pages 18 and 19. My second two-page spread, and both in the same series. Panel 1. The ash and ember are becoming indistinguishable from the stars, which fits Gwendolyn's dialogue. Panel 2. The outline for this section of the funeral simply says, Kenzie sings. It was something I really liked having him do in issue four, and thought it would be a nice touch for this moment. Panel three. Here's another reuse of that paper plate model with the risk pieces. The smoke coming off the pyre is all made of my thumbprints in ink, and then isolated as a color hold in the coloring process. Unlike the Ballad of the Ivory Lass from issue 4, when I had a melody from Jesse Glenn to work from when writing lyrics, this time Jesse wasn't available, so I had to use something else as a temporary melody structure. I used When They Ring the Golden Bells from Natalie Merchant's album Ophelia, but when I eventually had to do a live reading of this story at a school or library, I realized I couldn't use that melody and had to create one of my own. Here's a version of me singing it, that I recently recorded. Past the trees and thickets burned, tis the home we cloaked my servant, where in death the brave to can thrive. Out beyond our living reach, and just past our mortal speech, heroic tales of glory still kept alive. When our days all come to close, journey well to take repose. May thy spirit find the comfort we all seek. Leave in flame and glory be to the memory that were thee. As thy pyre burns and old bone creak. Wait beyond that hazy veil, When my spirit too shall sail, For my travels could end any a day. 
a walk out from our land to the hall of guardians grand if tis time i'm sure i'll know the way if tis time i'm sure i'll know the way page 20 panel 1 because of the way I draw mouse leg anatomy, it's very hard to show a mouse kneeling that doesn't make some part of the mouse look broken. I think I fudged it well enough here, but it still is a little odd. I worried about including the word hell here, partly because of my all-ages audience, but deeper than that it was because of the anachronism of me never establishing a negative version of an afterlife and purposely steering away from all religion in mouse guard. But I could think of no better way to convey the sentiment Saxon is needing to convey here, so I just went for it. Panel 2. It is this scene that hopefully makes it clear that Gwendolyn is the mouse that Saxon has been loving from afar, and his experiences returning to and from Dark Heather have pushed him to tell her, at least in some way. Panel 3. In the pencil stage for this beat of the horror in Saxon's mind of what he's faced, I just pasted in a cropped portion of the bones from issue 4's cover, and then inked them by hand again on the light box so that the line quality matched the rest of the page. Panel 4. Again, I almost never write dialogue when writing an outline, but I'm looking at the paper now, and it has Saxon's exact line as the bullet point for this page. Panel 5. How do you draw mice kissing when their mouths are on the underside of their heads? I can tell you that it took some fussing to get the right amount of contact to convey a kiss. Page 21, panel 1. In the foreground is Annika, who has a plaid cloak, something I don't want to have to draw often because to achieve this look, I draw the plaid pattern in ink and then isolate those lines for color holds in the coloring process. But the focus of this panel is Liam, hearing the dialogue from the past, which I decided to do not as a ghostly box, but a regular narration box, just tinted like the snow pages. To get the look of a flashback for this panel, I put a layer on top of the entire panel, except for the black panel border, set to screen layer mode, which lightens everything to feel faded like a memory. Kalanaw's word balloon is jagged because he is dying. The words are falling out of his throat. Panel 3. A burning mouse corpse was a hard panel to draw and not make look horrific. I inked most of this with a brush, if I recall correctly, and I used a color hold over everything to let the color sell the visuals of flame and pyre. Kalanaw's narration box, also jagged like the balloon above, with the owl's statement now come to full fruition. Page 22, panels 1 through 3. Liam realizes here that it could have just as easily been him to be dead in the snow, with Kalanaw still alive. And Kalanaw reveals that for him, this time, Liam was the greater good, the thing worth protecting and dying for. I broke up Kalanaw's statement between panel 1 and 2 so that I could have the impact of you in panel 2, with Liam in present time watching the pyre burn. In that last panel, Kalanaw saying... Putting this off for far too long is, one, a reference to Bilbo passing on his ring to Frodo, but two, something I explore in the Black Axe book and the protocol for handing down the Black Axe and what Kalanaw was looking for and whomever he bestowed it upon. Page 23, panel 1. One last full shot of Liam as we are about to learn of his destiny. Panel 2. The mantle is passed. Liam is now the Black Axe. Careful lock haven aficionados will notice that the pyre balcony is above the window box of Gwendolyn's office, and somehow it didn't accumulate any snow, or the guard mice shoveled it in time for the ceremony. The smoke again is made up of my thumbprints, and like fall, the last panel of this series ends with a pullback shot of lock haven in all the elements. Pin up by Jane Irwin. Jane is a fellow Michigander and graduate of Eastern Michigan University. We didn't meet when she was attending school, but through my art history professor, I learned of a local alumni who was publishing her own comics. I contributed a pinup for one of Jane's earliest collections of her book, Fugeline. And then 10 years later, when I published the first issue of Mouse Guard, she was one of its first and biggest supporters. 
She did this pinup as I was just starting the winter series of a matriarch who she may have said was Gwendolyn fighting a snake. I used the visual in the stained glass of Lock Haven's library in issue one, even though the pinup didn't get published until this last issue of the series. And that's the sixth and last issue of Mouse Guard Winter 1152. It has been collected in a hardcover published by Archaea. If you've enjoyed this commentary, please leave comments in the section below. Let me know what I didn't answer for you in this issue, and subscribe for updates when I add more Mouse Guard commentary. Thank you for listening. Thank you.